Welcome to the Dry Fasting Club and the beautiful world of dry fasting. I'm Yannick Wolf, and I hope to be able to guide you on your dry fasting journey. Today, we are going to be talking about blood tests, and specifically a blood test that I took uh, about three weeks after a nine-day hard dry fast. Yes, I did not drink any water for nine days, just over 200 hours. And then I waited approximately three weeks uh, after I started refeeding to take this test. So what do people usually expect to see on a blood test after a dry fast? Usually people are surprised that you're not dead after three days of dry fasting. And then once they get over that shock and surprise, they probably start thinking that, your blood test must be off the charts and you've probably damaged all your organs. And then they hear that you've gone five days and they start to melt. And then they hear you went 200 hours and they think it's absolutely impossible and that you've probably lied. And to those people, I say, take a look at my live stream that recorded all 200 hours of the dry fast stuck in a room and camera never going off of me. Um... But then I guess the next step is thinking that I've damaged my kidneys because it's impossible to go 200 hours. But I'm here to show you what the test actually looks like. Uh, people usually expect your kidney function to have gone down, your liver health to uh, have gone down, so liver's not performing as good, for your minerals to be off balance. So we're talking about sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, phosphorus, um, we're expecting deficiencies most likely. And people also think that your thyroid hormones are probably messed up. Uh, and these are all valid thoughts. I mean, before I started dry fasting and learning about it, I thought not drinking water was crazy and a sure way to kill yourself. Uh, I definitely thought that kidneys would be damaged and the dehydration would cause systemic problems. So let's talk about the dehydration. Um, and before we get into this, I want to tell you that all, all of this information is on the dryfastingclub.com website. And it's under an article called After Dry Fasting Blood Test Analysis. So you can actually see my panel from after that nine day dry fast. And it targets a lot of different blood markers, and I'm not going to talk about all of them here. We don't have enough time, and I don't want this to be a three-hour episode. But if you're taking blood tests and want to compare, or if you uh, just are curious and want to see all the different blood markers, you can take a look. I'm not saying I'm the healthiest person, because dry fasting was started uh, when I was at one of the lowest points of my life with an autoimmune disease uh, called long COVID. It happened after a COVID infection. And I have basically got my life back together. And at this point, I am working on becoming or getting to the best point of my life and then surpassing it. And I believe that I am easily on that path right now. Anyways, check out the blog article and you can dive deeper into a bunch of different blood markers. There are a few that I wish that I had taken on top of it, but I am in Canada and you do need to uh, get a doctor's requisition. So you do have to kind of game the system a little bit unless you want to shell out a lot of money for private tests or if you are friends with doctors, which... I kind of am and why I'm able to get some of these tests for free, but I, there are a few more that I'd be taking and I will do my best to get them on the next blood draw. So expected dehydration damage. Um, where would you be able to see this? So there are probably two of the main, there's a bunch of tests that you can take, but two of the most popular ones that everybody's going to see on like their broad metabolic panels are going to be kidney filtration, which is the GFR. And in this case, it's called the EGFR. So estimated glomerular, glomerular filtration rate and creatinine. 
So creatinine is what's measured in the blood. And then based on things like your age, uh, sex, weight, um, they take creatinine and there's a calculation that gives you the estimated rate. And that's basically how they tell you uh, how your kidneys are performing. So that's where you'd be able to see it. Um, most people think that you'll see really bad kidney function, but you need to take into consideration metabolic water. So people think that basically you are going to die without water and that you're going to be super dehydrated. And they are not aware that there is something called metabolic water. And that means water created by your body. Yes, your blood does get thicker. There is an element of dehydration when it comes to dry fasting. Um, but your body is really powerful and is able to put you into homeostasis. And this homeostasis actually triggers a lot of the healing that you can't get anywhere else. You get things like microtubule repair and a faster uh, chaperone-mediated autophagy. So when your blood gets thicker because of this dehydration, you actually trigger uh, healing because of a hypertonic state in your body. And you can't get this with water fasting. You have to take that into consideration because you're constantly pumping water into the system, so you're actually getting the opposite. But when your blood gets thicker, it triggers a lot of good things in your body. Um, when it comes to kidney function, it's important to note that on a test, I took a kidney function test that measured my EGFR, over a year ago, I was somewhere around a 79, and on this test, three weeks after my 90 dry fast, I was at an 89. So this is a massive improvement, and it goes to show that at the height of my symptoms, my kidney filtration was actually really rough. Um, this is confirmed by Dr. Filinov's statements that dry fasting actually heals kidneys. So this is something that is thrown around quite a bit over the last 20-ish years online where Dr. Filinov and a few other dry fasters swear by the fact that dry fasting actually improved their kidneys, which is counterintuitive. But if you take into consideration metabolic water, it means that your body produces enough water to Make sure that everything works correctly. Another great thing about this metabolic water is that your body is producing pure uh, water, which is not um, filled with toxins or, or substances that you get in like lead pipes or city water. So you're basically getting pure H2O and... It's important to note that mitochondria usually produce deuterium-depleted water, which is something that you can't get from outside sources. There's always a contamination of deuterium, or a certain level depending on the latitudes that you live at, uh, depending on what you're eating and the water that you are drinking. So you are getting the absolute best thing here through metabolic water. Yes, it also means that you have to really watch out with exercise, um, and not going past a certain threshold. So there's a threshold that your body can keep you at. If you exercise and sweat a lot during a dry fast, you may push yourself above that threshold, and that's where things become dangerous. But if you follow the protocols, if you carefully approach dry fasting, if you prepare for it, if you don't go crazy during it, and if you refeed well afterwards, there is almost no fear that you're going to cause any damage, but in fact, you are going to heal a lot of problems. Um, are there a lot of contraindications when it comes to dry fasting? So you may be looking at my blood tests and seeing improvements and thinking, great, I'm just going to jump into it. Yes, you have to take into consideration that there are some contraindications. If you go to dryfastingclub.com, you can find them uh, under certain articles, such as dangers of dry fasting, and you should be able to look under the search bar and type in things like contraindications or dangers. 
just off the top of my head, you need to watch out if you have late stage diseases, such as diseases of the kidneys, liver, blood, and vascular types of diseases. So in these cases, it usually has to do with your body's filtration system uh, and the blood system. If you are really struggling here, putting additional pressure through uh, dehydration and thickening of the blood, you can be putting yourself into a lot of danger. Unfortunately, dry fasting is the safest when you have a decently healthy body. This makes sense. But also, unfortunately, a lot of sick people come to dry fasting as a last resort. So in this case, you have to take it really carefully uh, and be aware of the risks. When should you take a blood test after a dry fast? This is an important question. Uh, a lot of people take the blood tests too early after a dry fast. So if I were to put a number on it, ideally you are taking a blood test one month or more after a dry fast. So it's important to notice that I actually took it a little bit early at three weeks. And by taking that into consideration, you can realize that some of my numbers may actually have been a little bit better if I had waited a week or two. The body goes through a big uh, rebuilding. So we know that the body rebuilds the immune system and stem cells get activated. And there are statements that the stem cells continue activation and rebuilding for up to two to three months after a long dry fast. So you can actually see improvements there. And I actually work with a lot of people that get feel horrible after a seven day dry fast. The detox symptoms are terrible. They refeed and they feel like they worsened, but then they slowly refeed correctly and they start bouncing back a week, two weeks, three weeks later. And they start noticing that they feel better than before they did the dry fast. And that just shows that they're going through crazy detox symptoms. Their body is yelling at them for doing the dry fast. Sometimes people overdo it and they go too long without taking the necessary steps and building the fasting muscle. But almost, I would say 95, 99% of the time, if you refeed correctly, uh, you will actually improve, even if it takes two to three to four weeks afterwards. And that shows that your body is constantly rebuilding. What can you expect if you take a blood test too early? And a lot of people actually do this. So this is, people message me and ask me to check on their tests and they freak out because they take a blood test a few days after their dry fast or during the dry fast. During is obviously you're going to be seeing different numbers as your body uh works on homeostasis and activating different mechanisms to buffer the acidity and start the healing. But if you take it right after, you can expect crazy numbers. You can expect higher ALT, which is going to show you that you have a liver problem, but really this has to do with gluconeogenesis and your body actually having to convert proteins and fats into glucose. Uh, you can, you'll see a worse EGFR because your creatine levels are massive because your muscles are being broken down and that's create, that's, uh, releasing higher amounts of creatinine. You can see lowered white blood cell counts. Uh, obviously we know after 72 hours, your body can almost do a whole, uh, wipe of your immune system and rebuild it. So this is another thing to take into quick consideration. Your body does, uh, reconstruct your white blood cells and your immune system. So if you're going on an extended fast and you break it, the next few days are actually really important because your immune system is in this uh, limbo where it's being rebuilt, but you can easily get sick if you go out with a wet head into a cold environment or into public and you have sick people around you. This is why you really have to take care for at least 72 hours right after a long dry fast and drink warm liquids. Don't drink cold stuff and make sure that you are eating correctly and you are boiling water and not eating raw food like raw meat and even water on that first day. You want to boil it and then cool it. 
Um, you can see red blood cell counts kind of off because your body's resetting. It's eating the bad ones, the old ones, uh, and that you can start seeing it a few weeks after you start seeing your red blood cell counts uh, stabilize as well. And this is all normal. But if you're taking your blood test too early, you're going to panic. Uh, how many dry fasts have I done? So in the last two years, I've done six hyperextended fasts. And those are, I count it as a hyperextended one if you're going seven or more days. Uh, and I've also done a bunch of shorter ones. So a bunch of five days, three days. But six hyperextended. And this was my seventh one. What are we going to focus on? Like I mentioned earlier, I'm going to talk about kidney, liver, minerals, and thyroid, and I'm going to skip things like cholesterol, iron panel, vitamins, white blood cells, red blood cells. Um, and there is a lot of other tests that you can take. I may mention them, uh, but if you want to read about these blood markers uh, that I won't be talking about, go to dryfastingclub.com. So we're going to jump to sodium and potassium. So we're going to skip white blood cells, we're going to skip red blood cells, we're going to skip the iron investigation, we're going to skip hemoglobin A1c, which is the diabetes marker, uh, arguably one of the best ones that you can check, and uh, just going to put this out there, it, I, <laughs> my A1c is a perfection at 5.2, that's the exact number I would be looking for if you're looking for perfection Okay, so sodium, potassium, and creatinine. So this section is going to talk about them, but there are five pillars of electrolytes when it comes to dry fasting and how I uh, want you to prepare and what I talk about in my protocols. And they're sodium, they are sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and phosphorus. There's obviously a lot of trace minerals that you also need, and that's why it's important to eat a healthy, organic, whole foods, varied diet so that you get everything. Um, I think iodine is also a pillar mineral in the body, we, but I'll mention that later. And honestly, that needs a whole post episode, blog post all about iodine because I do believe it's very important, but we don't have time for it right now. Um, there's a question. Is it possible to have a mineral deficiency with normal blood levels of said mineral? And the answer is yes. Many elements of blood chemistry have tightly regulated homeostasis in the blood, and that means that your body is buffering constantly. So if you're body goes a little too alkaline or a little too acidic, and usually this is with acidity, um, your body has to buffer it, and it needs to pull these minerals um, into adequate levels to buffer it, and then your body excretes them. So if you have the right minerals in the blood, you're fine. If your body gets a little too acidic, your body needs to pull it out of other cells, but usually it pulls it out of things like your reservoirs, like your bones. So on your blood tests, it's going to almost always tell you that your mineral levels are good in the safe range. This is because your body knows where to get those minerals. If for some reason your numbers are off, too low, too high, usually this is a cause for concern because you've gotten to a point where your body is not even able to buffer properly. You've either, either depleted your reserves or something else is wrong with you. But normally, you're going to see normal levels and you're going to think you're fine. But the problem is that most people have deficiencies. And even if you're deficient, your numbers are going to come back as normal. That's why magnesium and potassium are minerals that I really emphasize and I want you to load up on before a dry fast and during the refeed. If you're looking for a test that can actually test if you're deficient in them, because if you have an autoimmune disease or something like long COVID, I can almost guarantee that you're deficient in potassium and magnesium, mainly magnesium. You can do something called the tolerance test, and it's the gold standard for mineral deficiency. It involves being injected with the mineral. For example, magnesium, 
you then need to provide a few different urine samples as the body utilizes the magnesium. The idea is that if most of it is absorbed, it shows you that you are deficient. And if most of it is excreted in the urine, you know the body has good enough levels. The tolerance test is usually expensive and takes multiple urine tests throughout the day or days. And that's why most people don't do it and why doctors are, don't do it as well unless you pay out of pocket. Um, I already mentioned I am a big fan of supplementing magnesium and potassium. There are studies showing that as you increase your potassium and magnesium consumption, your longevity and improves. So basically your all-cause mortality goes down. But if you increase your sodium and not your other sources, usually if you get to a certain level of sodium and go above it, you decrease your longevity. So you're more likely to die earlier. That's something to consider and why I think supplementing and loading up on potassium and magnesium can do nothing but good for you. Obviously, don't go crazy, and there's a limit to how much your body can absorb during a specific time, and that's why you don't take a gram of elemental magnesium in one sitting. Uh, you would want to take it throughout the day and allow your body to use it and store it. Bone broth and eggs provide a very bioavailable source of all of these, but it, they also include phosphorus and other trace minerals, and that's why I love those foods, especially during a refeed, and you'll see them in every single protocol. I just recently talked to someone struggling with long COVID and uh, CFS, so chronic fatigue syndrome, and they said that as the disease progressed, they got to a point where they became allergic to eggs. And that shocks me because if you can't eat eggs, we really have to focus in on other foods that don't trigger histamine responses and your body can absorb. Uh, I'm also a fan of green juices that are low carb. And if strapped for time, then you can use greens powders, but only ones from trusted sources as a lot of these are contaminated and companies cut corners to make a profit. Creatine. We already talked about this uh, a little bit. So your creatine levels need to be measured when you are checking your kidney health after a dry fast. Uh, what is creatine? So creatine is a chemical waste product generated from muscle metabolism. It is produced from creatine, a molecule of major importance for energy production in muscles. Routinely, it's filtered from the blood by the kidneys and expelled in the urine. Creatinine is used in, in these blood tests to measure your kidney filtration rate. Um, and you need to be aware that these tests are not 100% accurate. So the, the tests don't know if you have a lot of muscle, if you are very muscular, or maybe if you have very little muscle. And... These can actually give you low kidney filtration rates and make your doctor think that something's wrong with you, or you might think that something's wrong with you, but actually the test is not taking into account the variations. So remember, it really takes into account an average person, uh, and that's how it's based on. Um, when you are prolonged fasting, uh, creatine levels also go up a lot. So that makes sense because especially during the first stage of gluconeogenesis, your muscles are the first things to go. And then your body slowly, if you look at this curve, your body eventually goes more into uh, gluconeogenesis from fat cells. And it uses glycerol when it takes them apart into ketones and fatty acids. But they do that faster on a dry fast. This is also why a dry fast is so much better because you lose less muscle. Because your body, because when it goes into that thicker blood dehydration stage, it triggers more fat burn for energy because fat produces more water. So your EGFR, that's your estimated glomerular filtration rate, an indication of how well your kidneys are functioning. Testing it is complicated, uh, and therefore it's based on your creatine levels, and they can be influenced by a number of factors, including muscle mass and weight. 
uh, sex, age, etc. Like we mentioned, creatine can also run high the leaner you are as your body catabolizes more protein. And then in the article, we have a image that shows you what EGFR levels are, stages. So if you have 90 or above, and remember mine's at 89, 90 or above, you basically have normal kidney function. Between 60 to 89, you can have mild loss of kidney function, and then you go 45 to 59, mild to moderate, 30 to 44 is moderate to severe, 15 to 24 to 29 is severe, and less than 15, you're at kidney failure. So take into consideration that mine is 89, and that I am very muscular, and I work out a lot, plus I took it the test pretty early, three weeks after. So that also could have given me slightly higher creatinine levels. And my diet has a lot of protein, um, especially during the refeed. So all of these, so we could have expected, I personally expect that my score in reality um, should have been higher. But anyways, an 89 is fantastic and I'm really happy with that. Uh, how to help your GFR. So how do we improve kidney filtration? There are many herbs and protocols out there that claim to help with kidney health. I really don't like diving into hundreds of herbs and supplements. My motto is kiss, keep it simple, stupid. And the same goes for healing organ damage and problems in your body. If I'm relatively healthy and want to heal my kidneys, I would make sure that I'm eating a well-balanced diet no processed foods, I would dry fast and not water fast because <clears throat> water fasting may actually damage the kidneys more than help because of electrolyte loss, higher muscle loss, and less metabolic deuterium depleted water creation. Those are three things you really have to think about. I would also use adsorbents like activated charcoal at night or first thing in the morning. Remember, you have to space that away from a lot of other things because it has such a powerful adsorption that it will uh, bind to a lot of things, medications, supplements, food, minerals, vitamins. Um, I would hydrate well in between dry fasts with clean water hydrating fruits and vegetables don't forget that hydrating fruits and vegetables have structured water and this is fantastic because this is very clean water filtered by the plant so think about watermelon strawberries celery tomatoes cucumber if you have a juicer you have access to these things just pop them in and drink that instead of water from your tap also a good digestive and detox herbal tea like chamomile peppermint and specifically dandelion root there are Others that are great as well, but these are very simple and uh, proven teas that help with the, your digestive system and detox. Um, so concluding the kidney health section, uh, taking into account that my number after three weeks of refeeding came back at 89, which is one point away from perfect kidney scores, means a lot. This is not my first rodeo. You need to be aware that I've done over six hyperextended dry fasts. Uh, and a bunch of shorter ones. Another thing to take into consideration is that I'm very athletic and love to lift weights and run. My body composition is above average on the muscular side. Knowing this should make you understand that my EGFR score is already artificially suppressed. Uh, and that just means that <laughs> the numbers are good. All right, we're moving on to alanine aminotransferase, and this is ALT, and this is for liver health. After this, we are going to talk about the thyroid, and then we'll end it at that. So alanine aminotransferase is an enzyme, and it is present primarily in the liver, and it really skyrockets during a uh, fast, and a dry fast in this case. So it plays a big role in gluconeogenesis, or glucogenesis, creating glucose from your muscle. So in the liver, it uses alanine as an enzyme to help in that uh, glucose creation while 
in the kidneys they also help you create glucose but they use it through glutamine anyways this is why uh alt shows you liver function and not kidney function and why your alt levels are going to be really high during a fast and shortly after it I actually worked with a few people and one of them had an insanely high alt score about a week after the dry fast and they panicked and the doctor was freaking out and i told them wait a few more weeks take another alt test they did and it was completely perfect normal levels um yeah so remember this uh this is another reason why you don't take them early uh and alt levels are for me are in the perfect range let me see if i can actually see what they were my alt was 25 and you want to have it under 50 so if it's under 50 and we consider 0 to 50 i am in perfect in the perfect range so liver health is great uh, i also have to add that liver cleanses are something you can consider to really help boost your liver um, people talk about liver cleanses and they talk about the stones that you pass and i don't think you really have to worry too much about that and just understand that the liver cleanses basically help you restart and clean your bile system out and usually that has a very good benefit for overall health so look into that uh, I write about it in one of my blog posts about intestinal cleanses. But don't just jump into it right away. Now we're going to jump to thyroid stimulating hormone, which is TSH, and basically thyroid health in general. So there are a few different tests that I would have loved to add into this. And if you have this opportunity, uh, look into getting tested for your T3 and T4 levels maybe testosterone, and also free T3 and free T4. So those are free floating in the blood. Uh, but most people are going to get a TSH test. So that is the standard testing on t with today's medical community. Uh, they just order you a TSH test. And that's thyroid stimulating hormone. And people actually think that a, this test tells your thyroid levels or your thyroid health and usually this is wrong because TSH is actually secreted by your pituitary gland so it doesn't have to do with your thyroid your pituitary gland tells your thyroid how much thyroid hormone it needs to make so if you are on things like an iodine protocol and taking in uh, larger doses of iodine your TSH is going to be elevated and we actually don't have a good explanation for this the medical community obviously doesn't um, and the functional medicine and naturopathic community basically has noticed a correlation if you take in iodine your tsh goes up even though you are improving your thyroid by doing this usually so anyways your pituitary gland in this case may have a problem and may be secreting too much tsh or too little but usually if your tsh is really low the doctors will try and tell you your hypothyroidism and if it's too high you may be in hyperthyroidism um but the T3 and T4 tests are actually going to give you a better picture of your thyroid health. Uh, my levels were pretty high, uh, even though they fell in the normal range. So if my doctor is looking at these numbers, he's just going to say, oh, you're in the normal range. This is another thing that you have to uh, remember. Doctors are pretty lazy and... As long as your numbers fall inside the reference range, they're just going to leave it at that. You actually have to go above or below for them to say anything. And even then, they're just going to prescribe you something. Oh, your cholesterol is high. They're going to give you a statin. And personally, I would never take a statin because I would rather work on the underlying issue instead of masking it with a statin that has already uh, led to a lot of complications in the future, like lowering your... Uh, coq10 and destroying a lot of metabolic pathways that i would prefer to avoid but anyways my tsh landed in the normal range but the high portion of it and that's because i am actually taking iodine i am doing a bit of an iodine detox um and but before the fast i try to load up on it a little bit and that is actually being shown here on this test 
I actually talk a little bit about iodine and the thyroid stimulating hormone, and I talk about the iodine protocol, but I really just touch on it in this article. So you can kind of take a look if you want to. Uh, under this blog, I talk about the pineal gland and iodine and adrenal fatigue, but this all deserves its own post and an episode dedicated to it. And we'll finish off here. Uh, everyone will have different results when taking a blood test. Usually, it can give you indications of what is happening in your body. However, the best indicator is always going to be how you feel. There's a reason people feel spectacular after a few weeks post dry fast. Your body starts to run more smoothly. Seeing near perfect results on kidney filtration and liver health is proof that dry fasting does not damage your body the way we've been taught in school and society. In fact, we haven't really been taught anything about dry fasting at all. We've just been told, drink water or you'll die. With these results, it's clear that there's more to it than that. It's clear that metabolic water exists, that the body is amazing at self-regulating, and that dry fasting activates deep level healing. There are studies out there for dry fasting between three to five days showing similar results. Actually, all the studies analyzing blood markers show great improvements after a dry fast. Of course, with great power comes great responsibility. And dry fasting should always be approached carefully and responsibly. As long as you follow careful steps for preparation, don't do strenuous exercise during a dry fast and refeed properly, you will begin a trajectory of healing your body. Side note, I know that a lot of people love to min-max and try to hack it, and there are things that you can do, but always start off safe, learn the limitations of your body, and then you can kind of veer off the path. So hopefully you can use some of the discussion here to better understand your own numbers after your dry fast. If you have the opportunity to take blood tests, find a doctor that will requisition them or go yourself. If that's not an option, then just dry fast. As dry fasting, it's the most cost-effective method of improving your health. The beauty is that as long as you eat a nutrient-dense, whole food, healthy diet in between fasts and refeed correctly, you will improve. All right, before we finish this off, uh, I'd like to remind you that you can join the Discord group. It is a nice growing group of people that dry fast, so you can find like-minded people and ask some crazy questions, especially if you've already been dry fasting for a bit. You can ask other people if they have had similar experiences or run some crazy theories. If you want to work with me because it's urgent or you have some uh, questions and are really scared of dry fasting, you can sign up on the members page on the website to get a direct one-on-one -on -one connection with me. I don't have a lot of time for these, but I do my best to uh, at least answer your initial questions and guide you a little bit through your dry fast. So feel free to do that. Uh, other than that, I wish you the best of luck on your healing journey and on your dry fasting journey. So until next time, see you then.